Jim Joyce, I don't know if you can recognize me. Looking good, man. Looking good. You've been working out in the uh, in the basement there, in the garage. Yeah, yeah, I'm working out. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I, I I'm loving the push-ups. I don't know about you. <laughs> right, right. No, it's it's transforming you. I, you might be you might you might be a little careful there. You might want to back off on the push-ups. <laughs> So hold on, let, 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 let you see the real me, because I know that's what, you know, that's why we get together every Wednesday, because you miss me. Right, right. so for our listeners, you were on, uh, what were you using there? So um, I'll, I'll actually introduce that when we have our, our awesome guest coming in, um, okay. just because that particular person, I think the people that have been watching the space know why, why I, I did this. And you know, uh, that also goes to show that we're really unproduced. I kind of really messed around. I think it would have been awesome if we all did it. But hey, listen, you know, technical issues. But um, let me, I, you know, I think our viewers, I mean, this is season two uh, already. Yep. I think they're aching for a little bit of stats. So I'm just going to go live real quick. Um, we still have not broken uh, 100 subscribers on YouTube. Um, it, my little tweet the other day went nowhere. We're still at 90. So if you're watching, just spread the word. Um, but let me start with our podcast series. Okay. Um, so we are now over 400 uh, downloads, whatever that means. Um, okay. Uh, that's good. I am not going to, and now I'm going to go to YouTube. So this is exciting. I, I haven't actually visited it in a long time. All right. 90 subscribers. Well, we knew that. Um, okay. and away got, from 100. I know. Well, almost there, almost there. Something over 5,000 impressions uh, okay. and something like 2,000 views across all the videos. Um, not bad. We're approaching 165 hours of people spending with us. This is pretty amazing. Um, exactly. Exactly. So, wow. And what episode wow. are we now? What episode were you in? Two, episode number four or three? Uh, I think two, man. No, who do we have? Yeah, no, we had, John I don't know and, the... we had John and Bill. Oh, that's right. John kicked us off, right? And then Bill. So this is uh, episode three. Yeah, I, I don't get to the counting part until I start posting the video. So anyway, um, I, you know, I don't know what else is going on on, on your side there. Any, anything interesting in Dublin? Any exciting yeah, news? No. Yeah, no. Now it's it, like, it's kind of, you know, it's like, you know, like with innovation, like you kind of, you have the euphoria, you know, of what's happening in the world. And then it starts to kind of plateau and kind of now we're, now we're just learning how to live, you know, to live like my office is back open. Um, I'm struggling yep. to work every day, uh, you know, trying to get some good habits like, uh, like that we've been taught by this time, but still it's not, it's not back to, I don't think it's humming, you know, it's not, it's not quite humming yet in the business scene. I don't know how you feel. No, honestly, the same. We're we're just not we're not there. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm just looking, making sure that I have the uh, the right the right domain name. Uh, this morning, I got an email from our friend Roberto and Healthware. Um, yep. They launched uh, some yeah new I think new normal dot health yeah new normal dot okay. health. Um, okay. So compilation of best practices, things that are happening, tracking. I, I thought it was interesting. I personally don't like the word new normal because it's just, I, but yeah. you know, but, but I guess it explains it. Anyway, um, I'm gonna, you know, so I'm, I'm gonna actually, I know you're gonna be jealous because um, our next guest, Shafi Ahmed. Uh, I met him years and years and years ago. Um, I, you know, he's a surgeon, uh, I think co uh, colorectal surgeon, uh, but it has been really in the forefront of driving, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, education democratization. I can't even pronounce the word, so hopefully he can do that better. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him in. So I, you know, I think, um, Hopefully the viewers can hear me, um, but I'm back. Looks like I'm back. So I'm going to let Shafi in. Okay. Okay, great. Shafi is coming on. Coming on. That's a pretty picture, Shafi. Hey, Shafi. He can't hear us just yet. Now audio. <laughs> now he's trying to switch to Lumi. Okay. So Lumi. that's the, that's okay. what you were asking. That's Lumi Live. And he's having some right. issues with Lumi Live. <laughs> right, right. 
like a little bit of, we should get him on in a second. It's, I can't wait to hear uh, Shafi's background. This is uh, this is a, a serious, serious digital health character. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's messing hey, with me. Hey, can, can you hear me? We can hear we can you. Hear you. We, we saw your virtual hair for a minute. <laughs> can you, can you see we, me now? Hold on a second. What's happened to Lumi? What's going on, Lumi? Come on, Lumi. What are you doing? One second. Let me go on, back. Lumi. <laughs> What's happened to my Lumi? Let's go. Let's go back. So while, while, while you're trying to figure that out, we were, uh, you know, uh, Jim explain. and I while very unproduced, we do have usually a quick call on Mondays, which we end up talking about everything else but Wednesday. Um, uh, and literally the only thing we said is, okay, let's try this Lumi thing and let's do it all. Um, but you know, your technical support is not as good as my technical support, so. so are we there and, now? You can see me. Yeah, hey. yeah, we can hey. see you, we can hey, hear Barack you. Kovic. <laughs> Jim, happy to see nice you. To good you. to see you. And uh, hold on a second. Hold, looking good, me, looking, hold, hold, looking hold, good. Hold, hold, yeah. Hi, Eugene. Hey, how come I'm waving too, but it's not doing anything with my hands. But anyway, we'll we'll figure that one out at some point. No, no, no. Can you see that? Can you can, can you do that? I can know. You do but I do it. Put your thumb up there. I am. Can you but do I'm that? Not, but it but it's not recognizing my thumbs. So. No, no. So you can't, it doesn't recognize. What you got to do on the Lumi Life um, app? Yeah. On the right hand side, you see the hand movements you can't yeah. you won't recognize your hands just do one of those they should move your hands uh-huh can you see it oh yeah okay so i can yeah. control myself with a oh, little thing said. that's it why don't we so, so we don't have too much yeah. dead space here why don't why don't you, why don't we explain lumi a little bit i don't know how that is well for, first of all shafi i i introduced you as the guy who is like virtual reality augmented reality you know, spearheading uh, education in, in, in health. Um, so why don't you do your own introduction first and then you can actually tell us a little more about Lumi because I saw you posting it. So, so hi, both of you. Uh, good to meet you, James. Uh, although nice you virtually uh, and through this avatar through Lumi. Uh, so I'm a surgeon by background. I'm a cancer specialist working in London. I have been working as a doctor for now. Oh, 27 years, and it's gone so quickly, and et cetera. My other interest around is innovation and health tech. Uh, I run a company called Medical Realities, which is a, like a VR education company. And I do a lot of advisory okay. roles for various health tech companies around the world, including governments. Uh, and I currently work also as the Vodafone, like a teleco company, as the ambassador for 5G and connected e-health, essentially. So I do a lot of stuff around that and try to use my passion to change other people's mindsets, I guess. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And so, talk. So, t maybe take. Would you mind explaining kind of Lumi where it's at, or you know what what's happening with Lumi? So, for people who can't see, uh, Eugene is virtually your your avatar is here, a beautiful looking avatar. You got you out of a t-shirt. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so Lumi is. I I got to I kind of. Um, shown it just about a week ago really someone said you should try this it's interesting but we've all been zoomed out over the last three months on zoom calls etc and they get a bit boring a bit repetitive and not quite sure whether to turn video off video on whether they're gonna make a coffee etc all those kind of things so what i think this allows you to do is create an avatar on an app which then becomes your avatar within the any screen it's on the, on the camera itself so you can use it on zoom on uh, teams for example skype whatever whichever platform you want to use it for etc uh, it kind of recognizes uh, your movements, your face, and your voice, etc. So you get some kind of um, um, kind of interactivity, if you like, within it. Um, and right. what that allows you to do, it takes away some of the Zoom fatigues. You can walk away now, make it to you, have your coffee, and with your voice, you'll carry on talking as it were you. So allowing the ah. other people in the conversation to assume that it's you and have that kind of, um, uh, I guess, continuity. So I think it has that role. But why don't that? It's, you know, about avatars and virtual humans and these are the kind of things we'll be doing going forward in the future across all platforms. So that's it. I'm, I'm okay. just, I'll give you one wave. Hey, everyone. It's Shafi on Lumi Live, on Zoom, on the Eugene and James Joyce show. All right, there we go. Shout of digital health awesome. therapy. So it, it's funny, Shafi. I'll, I'll like, shut it like, down and, and, share my, and just share my real face. One second. Let's just shut it all down. Yeah. Awesome. That is, 
that is unbelievable. That mm-hmm. is, uh, that's totally transformative. So like, we gotta, we gotta get, I want to get into like, like I'll let you ask the questions, Eugene, but I want to talk Google Glass. I want to talk surgery. And we got to talk Lumi, we have practical implications here. That's fantastic. So hopefully I think, I'll, I'll, re- I'll reappear, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully as well. Yeah. Yeah, we're all living in this kind of like, you know, this delay, the Zoom delay, right? Like the Zoom delay. Hope they get back there in a second here. No, I've just thought That's I'd go oh. back to normal. You know, Shabby, you like I, I know I saw you post about this, I think on LinkedIn, that yes, we do have fatigue um, and sometimes just want to kind of just have our, our, our avatar personally, and this is why I think Jim and I do this every Wednesday. <laughs> I miss hugs and I miss people and I miss, you know, even though I am on Zoom, so it's good to see your face, man. And not your avatar face. Yeah, good to see you as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're right, the, there's no such thing as uh, the virtual hug, is there really? It's kind of missing yeah. from humanity for the last three to four months or so, which is difficult for a lot of people, right? Yeah, so Shafi, I'm blown away. Like Eugene, I, you know, I, I, I had heard about you and I looked through your background and the awards and the accolades and, and the um, your proper digital health, you know, like uh, Eugene and I are interlopers, you know, we just build businesses. <laughs> we're, we're in it together. It's kind of, it's, it's a collaborative <laughs> approach. It's teamwork. We need all parts of, of that equation to make it work, of course. I'm just one small part of it, of course. Do, do you like, actually... so are you just at, you're in surgery, or you're in scrub? No, so often with these uh, Zoom, another thing I've found out is what do you wear? Do you wear a t-shirt? Do you wear a shirt? Do you wear a tie? Do you wear a suit? I said, for us, we get away with it. We can just wear this top and actually it's acceptable. <laughs> so you don't have to think twice about what you need to wear for Zoom, right? in which audience is looking at. It's, it's universal. I, <laughs> I don't want to know what's on the bottom, Shafi. Um... <laughs> Oh, but no, uh, no, you, no, you don't. You no, you don't, Eugene. <laughs> uh, do you do you miss? Because so, Jim, I, I know you and I travel quite a bit, and you also kind of zoom in and out. I'll see you at a conference in two minutes, and then I don't see you anymore. Um, uh, Shafi, uh, you're the only person that I know. I think travel. I keep, I keep pro- losing you, Eugene. I, I, I lose you. Yeah, we're losing. Can you guys you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yep. I, I got you now. It comes. It comes and goes. But yeah. Interesting. I will tell probably my girls are streaming something upstairs. Yep. Um, <laughs> I was asking, you're, you're the only person that I know that traveled like 10x that I did. Do you miss it? Um, how do you cope with it? So I actually made a, a, a conscious to reduce my commitments this year around traveling. And thankfully, actually, is the right choice because the pandemic came along and it prevented a lot of trips I'd plan. So I'm okay with that. I think certain trips are important uh, still, which I'd plan on as the pandemic unwinds, make those arrangements again. But I'm actually quite relieved not traveling as much. Last year, you saw Eugene, it must be in between almost 20 countries, I think it was. I mean, there's a lot of right. traveling. It's not glamorous, but people look at it. It's hard work, you know, it's tiring, exhausting. It's time to recover. Uh, but in effect, it was useful for me to do those. I had lots of projects, as you know, that needs to be completed. Uh, but I don't envisage traveling as much in the future. I don't think we need to. I think this whole pandemic has shown us that traveling uh, is not necessary. We can do things remotely as we have done, change our jobs appropriately, um, and actually work in a more efficient manner uh, on these kind of platforms. So I don't think anyone's going to be going back and traveling as much as we did before. I, have you I been agree. practicing clinic, clinically during the whole, uh, have, you been, have you been involved uh, clinically completely through this whole period? So I, I was on a sabbatical for a year and I came back in uh, April, uh, back to right in the center of, of the pandemic. So I've been working clinically the last few months. Also, I was part of the, the Nightingale Hospital team, setting up this um, hospital in the old Excel Center, the Exhibition Center, which is a kind of okay. um, rapid... Um, uh, hospital being built by the military and by NHS staff to potentially allow for up to 4,000 uh, patients all ventilated. We didn't need the capacity in the end as part of that as well uh, in, that, in the kind of the leadership team of it all. Now back in the front line, um, obviously we've seen uh, in terms of what of surgery, what's happened. 
Lots of elective operations have been cancelled, as you know, probably 50,000 per month in the UK have been cancelled because of the pandemic. We're only concentrating on urgent yep. cases and cancer cases that are appropriate. It's been a huge change of our clinical practice uh, and being redistributed to the workload, to the front line, helping out uh, redistributing our workforce and our junior trainees uh, in different areas. So it's been an interesting way of working for three and four months yeah. because of the, of the intensity and the priorities. But I think, we've, I think the health service itself has managed well um, in that sense. But what we've got now problem, um, uh, James, is the backlog, huge amount of diagnostics, huge amount of right. operations that we're going to take, I reckon, years to get back to the normality we had before, at least to, in control of the patients yeah. that need to be treated. And, and yeah, shopping, the backlog uh, something, and also, like, I was just talking to my, sorry, sorry, you did go ahead. Keep going, keep going. My connection. No, I was, I was talking to my medical director, my medical director for um, uh, Health Beacon, who's an oncologist, a radiation oncologist, and he was saying that his, his visits now have gone from, like, his um, inspections, his procedures have gone from, like, 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Yeah. So, so, so now he has this backlog. Uh, and he's fighting through it, but it's doubled the time because of the gowning up and gowning down process. Is, is that using the same thing? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's the, all the precautions you have to take. The patient coming into theatre, being prepared, putting up all your what's called PPE, uh, it's called doffing and donning, putting your equipment on, getting ready, um, and the operations um, are taking longer as a result. So it's less efficient, of course. It's uh, yep. intended to be much safer. Uh, and of course, there's the huge backlog of people waiting to be seen. And um, one thing is that's interesting, of course, a lot of patients aren't being seen in clinic at the moment to assess them for surgery. So that's not an issue. The outpatients, the, the backlog of patients just physically waiting to be seen with a problem. Um, and that's quite uh, sad in some ways, because some of these people might need urgent operations. They might want to be emergency. They're being delayed right. because of this. Um, and some undoubtedly would have a worse outcome, right? Just because of the fact that we can't even see them. Uh, for, to assess them properly. So a lot of issues around prioritization, uh, redistributing the workforce, and managing the acute crisis as we see fit, which have a knock-on effect on everything else. And, and Shafi, in, in, in the front lines, are you seeing a lot more usage uh, in the hospital settings of you know, little robots with the video screens, uh, any other technology that, you know, to avoid unnecessary contact if needed? Yeah, yeah, we are. So what we're seeing is a change in adoption, uh, Eugene. So let's take an example. The beam system that I've used for years, you know, the kind of the, the, kind of the iPad on wheels, if you like, that controlled by your smartphone or computer. I used that, what, four years ago? And there was a bit of pushback then because it's different. I was doing virtual ward rounds remotely, et cetera. Now that door's open. People are very open to using these kind of technologies. People using smartphones, iPads. And now we're seeing... People use mixed reality devices on the wall to train people because they can train people who are not on the front line, who can be elsewhere remotely. Of course, that's not widespread, but we're seeing a much better adoption of these kind of technologies where you can be right. Remember, during the kind of the real, um, at the kind of the center of the pandemic, when a lot of patients were unwell, remember, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't see, the relatives couldn't see the patients, right? They were dying alone almost because they weren't allowed to see them come to the ward. And so people right. are using iPads and computers, all sorts of things to see their loved ones remotely. Um, yeah. and that was a huge problem for a lot of people. So we saw the translations and kind of the, of these technologies much faster. There was less regulation, less pushback. And now the world is ready. So even when I came back a few months ago and I decided to do my beam again, I went around the wall with my beam system. It was accepted. The patients were okay with it. The nurses, the staff said, this is a great idea. Where do we get right. one? The competition had changed over three or four years, very suddenly, because you know, these last few months, as you all know, it's kind of, it's compressed time. So two to five years of innovation has been compressed to three months, but suddenly we need to do things differently. And so the regs have changed, people's mindsets have changed and shifted accordingly. And we're seeing much quicker uh, innovation into clinical practice. And that's been great. It means people like me um, and you, and other new James, are seeing actually that feature we were describing is now much more relevant. Um, it's almost as if we've, predict right. the future, now it's happened. Now the question is, where next? Right. And for me, that's about more translation, more yeah, yeah. penetration, how to do more of it. That's been great. It, so what, it must be what fascinating it, for you. Like, so I was reading, sorry, Eugene. 
we're I think we're delayed today. <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> we um, we got a um, so as like a futurist, like so you know in your bio we talk about being a futurist, and Eugene certainly oh. is, and. Uh, and, you know, and like I was actually thinking, I remember seeing Eugene on, I was seeing on the news somewhere in talking about you put a chip in you right right away, right? You know, you you remember that time you put like a, an implantable device on an yeah, I, I like went ages ago. Uh, I remember seeing it. And I, I, I went to, uh, for some conference uh, in, in Asia. Next thing I know, um, I, I, was being, I was being dragged to CNBC saying the man with a chip, right? So that was a fun, that was a fun trip. You guys, to sound. yeah, today is horrible, huh? But we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. Is it me or is it that's in your? I I, I think it's my connection, but as long as uh, okay. you you you'll be, Keep I'll just through. I'll just sit back today and kind of listen in. I don't know. This is kind of nice. <laughs> no, no, you you're coming through now. So so I, what I was what I wanted to ask you was so there's a bunch of things I wanted to ask you when I was looking at your background, but like all this like innovation. So you've been like finding you know, doing surgeries, Google Glass, you know, it's like, um, and then all this innovation comes flying at you and people are open to it, um, you know, but your role probably before was like champion it, you know, to people that might've been sometimes on deaf ears and, or people that weren't inspired or, you know, by it, but you were inspiring them, right? Like, so your role was to kind of inspire them. Hey, this is possible. You can do a surgery. I can train people. Um, you know, I can do those things. So, how are you feeling about it now? Like your attitude must be, you must be a little bit in flux or how are you digesting all the opportunity? That's a, that's a really good question. You're absolutely right. Um, being at the forefront years ago and saying, this is what the vision is, uh, was if you're alone, you're out on your own on a limb, trying to prove something and say, this is what we should be doing. And now that there's a wide acceptability, it's good actually. It means that A, that you were correct, <laughs> that you were completely crazy, James, or the main times right. that uh, people right. felt I was. Um, but I'm just saying that now we're seeing, uh, how do I support? How do I, how do we make change more rapid? How do we make it stick uh, across more sectors? How do more people come to this? We want to promote and attract more people to innovate now and use these technologies. Right. So my role now is facilitating that wider conversation. Yes, now we've seen it, the concepts worked, it's relevant, we're using it. What about mass adoption? What are the other barriers for that? How do we collaborate better, yeah? So I see my role now moving slightly along. So actually, uh, we've done the proof of concept. Now let's just move it forward and let everyone have access to these kind of wonderful uh, technologies to improve. But do you feel like it's, do you feel like it's frenetic right now? Like the whole thinking around this is like the freneticism, dude. That's how I feel. Like, you know, it's like, uh, oh, you know, there's like all these opportunities. You got to run from this to that. Or yeah. are, you, are you probably more chilled out than me? <laughs> no, no, it is frenetic at pace. Everyone's thinking about what's next, what's next, let's do this. That's good, right? We want it to be fast because we don't want to go back to the old normal, right? The worry that is, right. you know, you, you do this for a while and people say, actually, let's forget it. It was okay for pandemic. We're going back to being... Um, very slow to adopt, but I don't think that's going to change. We want people to be frenetic. We want systems to work much better, much faster. Because healthcare demands that pace, right? It's always been slow. So I don't mind people being frenetic or the society and the healthcare systems uh, being much more rapid in the implementation. Uh, and I would, I would encourage it, quite frankly. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's okay. I don't mind the pace at the moment. <clears throat> And, and Jim, I will have to tell you, hopefully you can hear me, Shafi is more chill than you. So just, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> but can I, can I, bar, Shafi, bar, uh, I bar. <laughs> can, I, can I drop you all the way back when you had this flashlight, like what was the first, um, I don't know, that spark that said like, hey, you know, using this technology, I can actually educate people around the world, right? Like to me, when I remember seeing, I think it was the Snapchat streaming that, and, mm. and some of the locations that people watched your, your surgery from, to me, that was like one of those moments, like, holy crap, right? Yeah. Um, so can we bring you all the way back? And then I'd like to know what's in the future also. I mean, you know, for us. Yeah. So if we, let's get back to 2014. Gosh, a long time ago, right? 2014, gosh. It's gone so quickly. So look, I think at the point, I was uh, obviously a surgeon in clinical practice. I, was also, I also had a role at the medical school. I was the associate dean at uh, Bart's Medical School that you've uh, visited, Eugene. Yeah, yeah. And, so I, had an, and I, I was also do a lot of training for surgical training. So I had a lot of interest in education and et cetera uh, for surgery across all, all, all spectrums. 
What I was struggling with was new ways of learning. I realised that students were getting bored in the operating theatre. They're often sitting in the back, not engaging, because it's busy in the hospital environment. So the operating theatre, operating room is busy, a lot of people. The people that get neglected are the people in the back of the students. They just don't get adequate learning. And we hadn't challenged that for decades, if not centuries. This was the way of teaching surgery to the masses. And it wasn't real learning. It was a learning, what I call by a diffusion and osmosis, just by being in the presence of something, you might pick up some information. It wasn't active learning at all. So I was used to experiment with my students. How do I train you while in the operating theatre? I created a room next door for them to do some suturing, some stitching, et cetera, to keep them interested in the eight hours that we were doing the operation. And then, of course, then I realised that we could uh, train people much better. And then the good glass came out, of course. And for some, suddenly, the technology was available for me to um, challenge what the traditional ways of learning work. And I was interested. So well, actually, I'm ready for this. Perfect solution. It makes sense. Yeah, I had the utility to justify what I was trying to do with those students. So that's what it was. It was just the fact it was available at that point. So very quickly, we streamed live operation, uh, which went global, uh, went to many people. I think I trained uh, 14,000 people in 118 countries. Just showing that actually just by having a wearable tech, connecting people, people with smartphones, which was ubiquitous, we could learn from anybody around the world, which I always thought was a fundamental human right. And access should be beyond geographical boundaries and away from resources should be just free the point of contact. So that was my mission. Then a few later, of course, uh, Snapchat brought out spectacles. How funny was that, right? <laughs> so, so, and I just, you know, uh, I'd been on Facebook for a bit, um, uh, on Instagram and Twitter and that kind of stuff. And Snapchat wasn't really on my mindset really. This was for young people, etc. As I thought about it, actually, I think, you know what? This is actually really- Hey, we're still young, by the way. We're still young, damn it. Young at heart, definitely, as you. So I was thinking, this is actually quite relevant because if you look at my students that I'm trying to teach, teach uh, they're all between the ages of 18 and 25 in fact the snapchat used that point 70 percent were the same age group this is what how this was their language this is what they use right. routinely but okay that's that's the platform so why don't we use what they understand rather what we understand because we've moved on 30 40 years and society's moved on so when i the spectacles came out which i managed to grab a pair of i thought if i just push this out onto you know the story uh, on snapchat and do um, 10 second clips. I thought about how do we create learning that's gonna be compelling for people and accessing immediately around the world. So we did a small operation, which is a hernia operation. Um, and then I thought about it beforehand with my trainees, okay, let's cut up small bites of learning because people want bite-sized learning now. So we did 10 second yep. clips, about 20 clips, which they recorded during the operation, pushed out to my story. I must say, all things I've done, I've done many crazy things. I thought that was one of the crazies. I, I was really apprehensive about you yeah. know, using social media, will I lose credibility, am I being professional here? Where are the right. ethics? Where's the confidentiality? How about patient concerns? Is, I, I was so unsure. And I didn't share okay. that with a lot of people, but I just thought this is just pushing that boundary perhaps too far, but let's see, control it properly, right. get 200 medical students to view it, so get feedback from them. Then of course it went viral. It went absolutely viral. Uh, it was published on a, uh, an article on, I, I played on Friday afternoon. Um, and by the evening it was out in the press. Um, one of my colleagues reported it uh, in the US and it went viral. By Saturday night, I had uh, the editor, one of the editors of Time Magazine phone me at home randomly and saying, Can I, I'm coming on Sunday afternoon take the story. Will you share the story on a Sunday afternoon? I'm coming to you especially. When do you get that kind of phone call? So he came in and shared the story. Wow. Once he shared the story globally, it went viral. And so the story that usually was going on about, the reach, that was the most amazing thing. So I started doing regular operations on Snapchat. I've got a huge following um, across the world. Wow. And I used to ask my, my, cause obviously in those days, Snapchat didn't tell you about a geographical location of your, of your people that were watching or your followers yeah so it's asked a question of who are you tell me where you are where you're watching it from i'd love to know get a bigger picture of where you are and the reach of this honestly the reach right. was amazing every part of the every part of the world was included and one thing just stood out for me which the story that i shared with you Jim, i was found a message from a girl called ella i always remember her name ella she said hi um professor ahmed thank you so much for teaching me i'm really enjoying your teaching and, uh, and by the way, I am actually a third year medical student in the Marianas Islands. Right? So I thought, okay, where's that, right? No idea. So I Google earthed it and I found a small island 
island of about 12,500 people in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And she was literally watching it from there, getting learning, and sharing experience with me. And I thought that was so powerful that you can suddenly wow. reach people in the most remote circumstances and who is still learning from your experience. And that, for me, really was the kind of um, the, the validation of trying to move that forward and teach people on a global level Amazing. and share knowledge on a global <clears> level. And that, that story will stay with me forever, of course. And I always remember Ellie. I wonder what happened to her, actually. I must try to find out at one point what happened to Ella. So my, Shappy, you, you know this, uh, my daughter, Shane, obviously wants to be a surgeon and you're yeah. like her, her idol. We actually, just as a joke, I got her the game operation right? Uh, but, <laughs> just as a, as a joke. But I, I, I'd love to know where, because, you know, for, for myself, I, you know, just looking at, I hear robotic surgeries. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about kind of what's actually being done purely robotic versus guided? And where, you know, is that the largest opportunity for technology or in, in surgery, like, or, or, or what? what? What else could it be? Let, let's really futurize this. Just, just before I got on the conversation, I had a whole hour uh, talk about digital surgery with some people globally about the future, what's going to happen. So I can yeah, share perfect. the thoughts I was just sharing an hour ago. So digital surgery is a new concept, I guess. You know, digital health is a term that came out years ago. Hard to define what it is. Still hard to define. <laughs> it, found its, it, found, it found its place in the wider world uh, of medicine. Digital surgery is more of a newer concept. Um, in the last couple of years, people talk about this whole idea of, uh, of surgery that's become more digitalized. For me, it's an end-to-end -end piece. From the beginning of the patient's pathway, from telemedicine, from e-consults to e-consents, to getting the data, patient empowerment, and then, of course, this whole process around the operation. And the OR is going to change immeasurably. It's one of the most exciting times, uh, I think, in surgery, where all the technologies that we're describing are coming to the OR fairly quickly whether it's, right. for example, robots, whether it's AI, machine learning, whether it's voice tech, whether it's AI and VR, for example, it seems a natural fit to this kind of ecosystem of the operating theatre. That's where we're seeing a lot of traction. A lot of companies, startups, are pushing yeah. hard in that direction. The surgery has become really attractive in that regard. So robots, let's work with robots themselves. So the question about robots was, that, look, Intuitive Surgical brought out the Da Vinci uh, two decades ago, I think it was right now, uh, around the year 2000. And they did a great job in pushing it out, uh, showing the data, validating the work, showing that it was a good um, uh, technology that maybe helped with visualization and some operations, particularly the prostate operation uh, in the US, which is driven quite hard from industry perspective. Now seeing a wide dissemination. What the robot allows you to do is take away your perma, look in certain areas of the body, like the abdomen, the pelvis, show a better picture, better quality, maintain, and so you can do more intricate things during the operation. Certainly it's better in that sense. It's hard to prove improvement outcomes. Outcomes are measured by mortality, morbidity, crude measurements. It's hard to show the difference. Right. There are no differences. It just allows better operations to be performed. But right. It's data-driven, so therefore we could improve. And now we're seeing more robots come into the market. You know, Google team with a firm, Johnson Johnson, the verb of coming out, Medtronic, Cambridge Medical Robotics in the UK, and others, many. And, out. and so Medtronic, bought, Medtronic bought touch surgery, right? Um, yeah, but if the, I'm not mistaken. They changed the name to digital surgery, that's right. They got bought out last year, this year actually, early. They've done a great service, done really well. Uh, they're about uh, AI analytics and uh, visualization. So the, back to the question about robots. So robots are there to support. We've seen some people now use robots for remote operating. A few examples using 5G connectivity, doing transcontinental uh, training operations, for example. We've seen now that happen because 5G is now coming in and it's got low latency and, and uh, high bandwidth. But the other thing is around is the visualization. If you look at, say, a laparoscopic surgery on a, on a kind of a screen, so the guys at Touch um, are now looking at how we analyze that properly so you can map it using AI so it can direct you navigate you through the procedure uh, hopefully allowing less mistakes to be made allow the team to work better predicting the outcome and in time you'll be seeing you know structures being pointed out but at risk for example to help you during the operation which you've never had before it's just based on your own right. experience your own vision 
Nothing else to support you if you go off in one direction. It's just your own intuition, if you like. I think that's, right. going, to be, that's going to be interesting. So that, when you sweat the surgery regime, that's the future we're looking at. Data visualizations. Deep and machine learning to um, navigate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, there was two things maybe just as you're talking, just to cover, and I'm sure you covered anyway, but is, is so when we look around, like, I, again, your background, you, you work in Bangladesh, and I think you worked in Bolivia. You know, you worked in, like, kind of on a global stage. And um, the fact that, you know, quality surgery, surgery is not democratized, right? Like, so, so um, like, I was fascinated when I moved to Ireland. I grew up in the States, and I live in Ireland. And I remember coming here and seeing how people were fantastic at certain kinds of sports, but they say weren't very good at basketball. But now when I see young Irish kids playing basketball, they, they sometimes have the movements of what look like almost look like American kids that spent their life because they watch YouTube and they, they will follow the NBA. So you, like almost naturally the kids look like an American kid playing basketball. And, you know, so I, I may, may, but as an analogy, like are the surgeons, do you have surgeons competing to be as good in Bangladesh or Bolivia as in London? You know, is that possible or, or what's happening from there? So no, I think as a surgeon, as a healthcare worker, James, everyone wants to be the best they can be. It, that's not unusual, right? You, everyone's driving to be the best surgeon, be better, improve. Yeah. And it's just part of our DNA, isn't it? What they lack, of course, is training sometimes, or the access to training, and also access to the, the tools, instruments. Yeah, and they make do. So surgeons around the world are of equal capability, just as good clinically, make the right decisions. But what they're limited by is access to improvements, to access to knowledge, to training, to, which is all that I have available to me in the UK and more than other people. And also that technology is going to be the driver where theoretically you could train anyone in the world. And I'm hoping the world that we live in going forward will be democratized. We can reach out to people around the world, access great learning, access people's um, uh, uh, experience, and perhaps even remotely be proctored, remote proctoring, remote telementoring, whatever it is, which may really help that. And the other thing is, as we adopt these technologies, and as they become more affordable and more cheaper and more accessible, you may see a data-driven healthcare system that's much more um, uh, standardized. So you can assess yourself on quality based on good metrics rather than these kind of vague areas of morbidity and mortality, which are really not accurate at all, as you know, right? There's many things we do. If you do a risk analysis of something going wrong, you very rarely look at the operation and what happened in every detail. It's just, it's the process you're looking at. And perhaps at some point now, we can assess people's competence, the technical ability, the decision making, the, the, the deliberation in the OR, the time taking, all the kind of data points that could help us uh, say right. that actually we can standardize care in a different way. I, I think that's the aspiration, James, I think. It, it, so it, I don't it, want to be a party pooper here. <laughs> I don't, I really don't. I actually got, got just mesmerized. So we're, we're, we're actually running a little longer than normal, but um, I don't know, Jim, I, I, I'll, I'll leave you the last question too, because I'll, you just. Yeah, no, dig it in, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, dig it in, dig it in. The other last one is, so I, so in the area um, of non-clinical, non-classically clinical trained people being mm. able to do procedures. Yeah, yeah. You know, any thoughts on that? Yeah, great question, absolutely right. Look, if you look at the data, now, I share this often with people. Um, the Lancet Commission, now five years ago, maybe six years ago, five years ago, 2015, produced this report on global surgery, right? And we're going to be about 2.2 million people short. That's anesthetists or anesthesiologists, uh, Eugene, surgeons, um, and other healthcare work, and, and gynecologists uh, by 2030. Globally? So, globally. So wow. 2.2 million people we need just to make healthcare equitable. And they estimated 5 billion people cannot access surgery that's safe and affordable. That's a huge problem that we have. So can you train that many people tomorrow? Of course you can't. Impossible, right? You've got to have new medical schools, new training, impossible. So I think the workforce has to be smarter, use the existing workforce in a different way. Does it need, for example, a surgeon to spend five years at medical school, then another four to eight years training? to drain an abscess, to take out a small lesion. Of course it does, it makes no sense. Let them do what they're trained for, that's more complicated, more specific. Let other people get trained in short periods of time, take out a sebaceous cyst to drain yeah. the abscess. Because in the third world, or in low middle income countries, you can't access that, you have to retrain the workforce. 
let nurses do operations. Let other people say, okay, how do we use the workforce more smartly? We go back to the concept of the pandemic. The pandemic has shown us that we can use people in different ways. We've redistributed the workforce from the front line to the ITU. I froze anyway, maybe. <laughs> so suddenly we can now just actually just train people in different ways. So actually, let's use the workforce more smartly. Where are the gaps? How do we use people? Uh, and I think that's the, that's the correct way of looking at things and actually not being hierarchical, saying yep. we're all, you know, we can all do this, support people. And how do we use that workforce in an appropriate manner? And some of the stubbornness and the dogma tradition is out the window because otherwise we can't justify uh, the healthcare of the world. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to stop us here. Uh, just also, I mean, the, the connectivity today, I think everybody, if this was live, I would know why, because everybody wants to see Shafi live. So that's why. Um, uh, but it was a pleasure. Um, just, you know, for everybody watching or listening, just hit that subscribe button on YouTube. As I keep saying, show to show, we're trying to hit the Joe Rogan status, the Jim and I. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's a wrap for this uh, episode. Season two, episode three, I think. Woo That's a wrap. <laughs>